So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you three quick questions, and I want to kind of uh, see who can answer them quickly. If I'm doing this, what am I doing? Typewriter. All right, I've got some oldies there. If I'm doing this, occasionally swiping like this, what am I, what am I typing on? Tablet. Tablet, that's right. If I'm doing this, what is it? No, it's Tinder. I'm joking. Okay. So we've got a healthy mix of different uh, folk in the room, and it's important because I'm going to uh, go very, very high level. The aim of my conversation with you today is, and it's a fireside chat. I'm not going to geek out. Um, the single thing I want you to take away from this conversation, and it is going to be a conversation because I'm going to keep asking you questions, is what are you doing today to get yourselves ready for a couple of things that are going to come at you, like freight trains, so you don't run into brick walls, that you're actually prepared for this transformation that's about to come about. And this is in platforms and technology and devices and software and infrastructure and managed services in the way we approach IT service management. All these changes are happening. These are conversations that are happening whether you get involved or not. So the thing I'm going to try and get us to think about this morning, um, and, I'd, and I'd love to uh, catch up over lunch or in the afternoon in the breakouts to, to answer any questions you've got about it, is are we already thinking about these changes and, and what we need to do about them, um, or are we just going to let them run into us and, and suffer consequences later? So uh, I have this, ter this term, thinking out cloud, because it's exactly what I want us to do. Um, but the punchline is that um, it's critical that we get really serious about building open cloud architectures and open platforms uh, where we're consuming things as a service. Um, because uh, this is the default approach that everybody from the vendor land and hardware and software and infrastructure and managed services and security are taking by default now. This is what they're doing by default. It isn't a nicety, it's a necessity. And if we don't get on board with it, then we're going to get left way behind. I just spent a week in Las Vegas at the World of Watson talking about cognitive computing. And it was a real wake-up call for me because I thought we were doing okay in Australia, but we're 15 plus years behind. Let's not let that happen with cloud. So when it comes to delivering services to government, I think that we really need to sit up and pay attention to what's happening elsewhere in the world and how we're going to do that. And we just had a taste of that here. So I'm going to just really quickly run through about a dozen or so things. I love pictures. So I'm going to just put some ideas in your head to get us to a point where we can have a conversation about what I just covered there. So Cloud 101, what's the hoo-ha about? So I hate bullet points. Bullet points are my pet peeve. So this is a picture of Mount Fujiyama. It's got one big cloud over top of it. Um, when a lot of people talk about cloud, they think about what we really mean when we talk about virtualization and hypervisors. But the reality is that virtualization and hypervisors are not cloud, not even remotely close. Taking a physical server and virtualizing what runs on it, the P2V journey, and they're putting it into a cloud platform in a VM format is not cloud. That's just a lift and shift, taking it from a physical machine to a virtual machine and potentially being a little bit clever about how we orchestrate the use of that. That's not cloud, not even a million years. Clouds from the hypervisor up is about consuming different levels of services. So here's the same mountain with a few more layers on it, and it took me a few hours to find these pictures. Um, so in this, imagine we've got one stack in the previous one. We think about it as hypervisor, so Hyper-V, VMware, and things like that. In this space, I want to visualize this idea that there are multiple layers in this cloud stack now, whether it's dedicated hardware, metal as a service, infrastructure service, platform service, software service, or XAIS, so database as a service, security as a service, router and switch, and anything as a service, even professional services as a service is a thing now, apparently. Cloud's about consuming things as a service and orchestrating the consumption of that in a very agile and nimble way. If I want to do something right now, I should be able to self-service and reach out through a console of some form as a non-technical person and consume that. And an example of that, and, and a lot of people in the room may think, well, you don't adopt cloud. No, everyone in this room actually uses cloud already. And if you disagree, I'd love to have a chat about that later on. But internet banking, you know, hands up who went to a bank recently to take money out over a counter, not an ATM. Anyone here been to their bank recently in the last three months? Hands up. Yeah, you have been? Really? Interesting. OK. Um, was it for day-to-day -day banking, or was it something like a home line, a new home line? For day-to-day for -day banking, so taking money in and out, depositing, have you, you know, are you going to the bank every day to a thing? No. Um, it, you are? OK, interesting. There's usually one or two folk. Um, for 99% of us, things like uh, web banking, phone-based banking, app bank banking is normal now. You know, Ten years ago, if I told my mum that she was going to use her iPhone to move money around and pay bills, she would have just scoffed. Uh, over the weekend, I went through the process to make sure she paid all her bills, uh, and she did it entirely on her iPhone on the bank app. That's cloud. 
The user interface is slightly different because it's an app. But she has no idea where the bank physically hosts its service, no idea where the data is, no idea where the apps are. She doesn't even know how the process works to get to and from. And the app itself is effectively the user interface, the browser. That's consuming cloud services in effect. So when a lot of people talk to me and say, oh, we're not going to go cloud, I kind of scoff and go, well, you make phone calls, you don't own a phone company. Um, you, uh, you do internet banking and you don't own a bank, you don't know where that stuff is. So the reality is we already do that every day, but we haven't actually necessarily brought it back into our back office and into, into what we're doing, particularly in government, because there's some challenges. But cloud is not hypervisors. Cloud is an entire stack of things and consuming things in that stack. It's also about consuming things at different levels of the stack from different places. So I might, uh, I might have one bank that I use for my home line. I might have a completely different bank that I use for a Visa card or my, my cash accounts. Um, and that's more and more the case these days. We'll have more than one service provider of different types. So we've heard of shadow IT. Everyone's heard of shadow IT. Shadow IT came about because CIOs couldn't move quick enough for some <laughs> parts of the organization to innovate. So people went and did things like bought things on their credit card, uh, Salesforce or CRMs and so forth. And that's still a thing. Um, so when we think about where we're going with the adoption of cloud internally, we need to think about it from the point of view that we don't actually have to have everything that we need in our organization to provide cloud services. It may be that someone else has something else we want. And we already see this. For example, there's agencies like the National Disability Insurance Agency who consume most of what they do from somebody else. Their financial services from one agency, they use that platform, they have desktop services from another agency, they even rent their desks and phones from another agency, so they're effectively consuming those as a service. Um, when we think about what we do in cloud, that's really the same sort of thing we're trying to get to. We don't really have to own it all and control it all, but what we do, we want to consume from multiple places. So what does an actual cloud look like? Um, when we think about clouds, we think about um, a range of different things. This is definitely not a private cloud. This is uh, Carl Lagerfeld with the, a famous artist who makes indoor clouds and takes pictures. But these are examples of private clouds. Um, one of them is a messy lab, um, but that messy lab uh, helped a bank get to the point where they had a proof of concept where they could then go and transfer their entire IT platform to cloud methodologies. They'd never run a cloud before, they never had their hands on it, so the challenge was, well, let's build one. Uh, and for a few thousand dollars, we took a bunch of PCs and we built one. The one on the other side, on, the, on my left, your right, um, is one from Canonical. They built a little box that they can carry around and they built an orange one originally to do demos at OpenStack Days and other events. This thing has eight nodes in it and you can actually buy it off the shelf. So you can buy a cloud in a box and build a lab around it. Um, this is my personal cloud. This is a bunch of machines I bought on eBay and it runs, a, and it runs OpenStack. Uh, you can buy one off the rack, as it were, if you'll pardon the pun. This is one you can just buy online. There's a small, medium, and large version. You can literally buy this thing with a credit card online. And it comes with you know, roughly half a petabyte, one petabyte, and two petabytes. And this thing's about uh, a couple of months old, so they probably do a much bigger one now. But generally, clouds look like this. Here's a normal series of racks in a data center running a cloud internally there. And that is an OpenStack distribution. Here's a box that I was personally involved in building uh, uh, a decade and a half ago. These days, uh, clouds are shipped in that format. Um, and in fact, there's one in the field. Um, and we all know that logo. Uh, deploying clouds in containers into uh, edge of the networks is very normal now. And here's one going on the roof of a building. And in fact, uh, a decade and a half ago, I got involved in putting those black boxes on the roofs of banks in New Zealand. Uh, although at that stage we hadn't created the concept of cloud and the coinage, but we were doing utility computing, which is still infrastructure as a service and so forth. And there's three of them still in New Zealand, two in Auckland and one in Wellington, in production on the roof. Why do we put them on the roof? Well, it was the only place we could actually get some footprint that it wasn't going to flood. If we put them in the basement, it could flood and we'd end up with dead hardware. So we got permission to put them on the roof, and it turns out the roof is a really good place to put heavy things in a building. Um, and it sounds weird, but um, one of the biggest search engines, or the biggest search engine on the planet now does this as well. Um, and I think this is low resolution because someone snuck the picture out. But this is a warehouse, just a tin shed basically, purpose built with nothing more than places to dump shipping containers full of cloud infrastructure and the trucks drive up and they actually have the same cranes that you'd use to take things on and off ships on a, on a wharf to put them in and out of these warehouses and they build them as fast as they need. In fact, this particular brand, who I won't name, is in the business of putting these containers into uh, organizations like TV stations, radio stations, publishers. So they're moving their cloud into the locations where the data is at now. So they're not moving the data across the, the wide area networks and, and over the internet. They're taking the internet and the cloud to where the data is. So AMS, NBC, CBN, uh, CBS and places like that, they've actually got this brand stuff in their basements and they deliver infrastructure. So when you go and search for certain types of content, it's actually coming from the basement of the people who make the content because they've stretched the cloud out there. Uh, and invariably, uh, they're either using their, their own st uh, stack on this particular brand, but other people are doing it with OpenStack. Here's another one. Here's a microcloud. 
This is a cloud that's out in the field. This is used to deliver content for this particular brand. Um, I had something to do with this because uh, Sun Microsystems was involved in the early days of actually designing what these are. These are little micro data centers out in the field. So these guys push as much content as they can out to the edge of the network so it's as close to you as possible. So they didn't even bother putting a data center uh, in place. They just put it in the street. So it's kind of, it's almost, you know, not fiber to the node, but cloud to the node. Here's an amazing little box. This is a brand called uh, C Micro. This box has 64 little uh, independent machines, if you like, inside them. Um, and when you look, you think, well, that's, why is that a cloud? Well, it turns out someone took one and put 160,000 instances of, of a cloud uh, 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 VM, let's say, in this thing. And it took them a few weeks to get it right. But when they deployed this thing in real time, in minutes, they could deploy 168,000 instances of something that looked and felt like cloud in minutes. You know, we, we couldn't do that with VM or Hyper-V in, in months. Um, and here's another one that might surprise you. This is a Z13 mainframe. This is a cloud. 70% of the world's banking runs on these pieces of hardware. Not particularly the Z13, but mainframes. 70% of world banking runs on mainframes still. Those banks want to go to the cloud. So IBM spent 1.5 billion US dollars reinventing the mainframe to make it cloud ready. This box can run up to 8,000 instances of not a VM, of OpenStack. Think about that. Now there's two in this picture. They actually put two together for some reason. It's actually on a carpeted floor in the middle of New York for a marketing event. But if you split that in half, each of those can run 8,000 full distros of OpenStack natively. Um, it runs Hadoop and Spark as well, so it's a big data platform. Um, so it isn't just the funky new uh, groups of people putting cheap PCs in, 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 uh, in containers. It isn't just people putting cheap PCs into uh, racks and data centers. Um, one of the biggest brands on the, on the planet just took their oldest piece of hardware. This is over 60 years old, this architecture, and reinvented it, which is kind of a word they're famous for. In fact, here's a naked one I saw a week ago in uh, Las Vegas at the World of Watson. They took one and took all the sides off and put Perspex and I couldn't help myself but hug it because I love the mainframe. So why is cloud so different? And why do we need to really get serious about how we look at it? It's different because in the traditional sense, organizations like government, large, large banks, air, airlines and, and airports in particular, could take six to eight months to stand up infrastructure to run a new initiative. It's one of the most painful things for any organization to do, to go somewhere and say, can I please have some infrastructure? Can I please have a virtual machine? Can I have a, a virtual private cloud? It could take months. In fact, News Corp used to take eight months to stand up an entire new masthead, a newspaper. Once we moved them through a cloud readiness assessment globally, all 78 companies, over a three-month period and ordered what they had, we found that 99% of the organization could benefit for, from cloud technologies. We took an eight-month-long process down to eight minutes. So now with cloud automation scripts, we can stand up in a public cloud in eight minutes an entire newspaper that used to take eight months. So it's, it's different because we can take all those little pieces and orchestrate the actual instantiation of them. So when we get, as you saw the uh, image before, the gentleman had um, oh, there, uh, on the right-hand side and to your right-hand side, they had a couple of machines that were sort of the open stack bit and then there's all this other stuff. That stuff is compute and you know, router switches, service, storage, compute. You can reach into that and build things in the logical and virtual sense and stand them up and make them run for as long as you want. And if you're running a three-month project and you need a SharePoint instance to run a PMO, you can do that in minutes now. We can do it in Drupal and WordPress. If you want to run a piece of analysis for a couple of minutes, you can reach out and cloud burst of that and do it in seconds. And if you've got thousands of cores sitting there just doing nothing and you want to use them, people should be able to just reach in and, 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 and orchestrate directly from their apps, and I'll show you an example in a minute, of, of just bursting into the cloud and consuming it. It isn't just like rack, pack, and stack and center anymore. So it's different, not because uh, this particular example, again, I'm obsessed with this guy and his clouds and door. Waving your arms isn't about it, and it's not about this either. This is um, a network operation center that does the back end orchestration of a very large cloud. It's about this image. It's about having the ability to go to a dashboard, a single pane of glass as we often talk about, but just to think about it as a web interface. Um, so if you've ever done any online uh, uh, travel booking, if you've ever done any ordering of food online, menu log, for example, is one of my favorite things. Every fortnight I let my kids order some takeaway Thai or Indian Chinese or, or whatever they might like. And we get on there and we effectively consume food as a service through the cloud and it just magically appears. So if you take that paradigm and apply that to everything you do as an organization, from the security at the front door with the cart swiping and the system that runs that, through all the way to the kitchen and all the procurement and management tool uh, so the systems that are required to buy the coffee and tea, to the HR, to occupational health and safety, to day-to-day -day systems like email and so forth. 
traditionally we have sat down and planned through ITIL models and, and, and project management to build these things and put them in place and design some sort of capacity model that says in the next three to six months we need this much storage. But that's a very painful and laborious process. What if we could go to a single dashboard and say I need all these bits, glue them together and orchestrate in a cloud sense as a service almost anything in the organization, what could you achieve? So this is the logical form of what cloud orchestration looks like. There's a dashboard at the top and there's network and storage and identity, identity management for authentication and there's object storage as well and block and object are very two different types of storage and we'll talk about them in a separate session. But you can create these instances of, of operating systems if you like or in services that bolt all these together and actually stand something up. Now in the traditional sense as I mentioned you could take up to eight months in a traditional IT environment to stand something up. Um, but if you have to wait for eight months to run an initiative that completely changes how many initiatives you drive because it's painful and it's expensive and you tend not to do them very often. But what if you could do it in eight minutes? What if you could do it, go to a web dashboard and say I need this, this and this and also add an application stack and push a button and just have it happen? Well, you'd, you'd probably get involved in a lot more initiatives to innovate in your organizations because it would actually be possible and doable and cost effective. Um, <coughs> In an OpenStack world, it could be as simple as literally drag and drop. Here's a simple example I won't go into a lot of detail of, but this is a full stack for WordPress, the open source content management system. Drag and drop all the bits you need, test it all glues together, push a button and it'll orchestrate and stand it up in minutes if not seconds depending on, on what type of cloud you've got. So it's, it's possible directly in the OpenStack world today to do all the things I'm talking about. But there are third party platforms and in fact um, a couple of gentlemen in the corner there are friends of mine from HP, they have a platform that comes uh, by default that does it as well. There are lots of ways for your current environments to actually have a single pane of glass that orchestrates old tech and cloud tech all in one space. And here's an example where some pre-built examples where we've got, uh, again, WordPress there, we've got uh, MariahDB, which is the database platform, Tomcat, Postgres. These are pre-built environments where someone's already done the work to take the stack and configure it and make it a push button. So if you come along and decide that you want a content management system and you're happy with WordPress, <coughs> you could quite literally log in, use one of these, push a button, and it would just appear. And the next screen you'd see was all the usernames and passwords and IP addresses and details you need to log into that and hopefully then change passwords. That completely changes the way you consume IT and the way you provide services. Now we talked about containers a moment ago. I just want to touch on them very, very briefly because if you haven't already dabbled in them or at least got the speed on them, it's critical. And I'll get to why in a minute. Um, but again, I'm obsessed with this gentleman, he's clouds. When we went through the physical to virtual journey, it wasn't that big a change in thinking. We stopped worrying about the physical box, we've got a virtual box, but it was essentially the same thing. It had a, a CPU and it had some RAM and it had some disk space and it plugged in network and you can install things in it. But it actually behaved exactly the same as a machine did when it was a physical box and we could box hug it. Um, we got the login in the screen, we could virtually put in CDs and we could install software in the operating system, whatever. So the, the transition from a physical machine to a virtual machine was almost zero effort and, and no mental change. Where things get really hinky is when we start thinking about them as services. Um, so the best way to describe that is that when you get on your car and you drive to work every day or if you go on a push bike and there's a multiple lane freeway um, and there's little lines down the middle that separate you, although the government's gotten a bit cheap and they're putting gaps in the lines now, I'm a bit worried about that and my safety, but I don't ever think about how those lanes got there. I don't think about who's maintaining the potholes. I just get in there and I consume those lanes as a service. Um, and so they're the closest I can get to a microservice in plain English. And that is that I don't need the entire road to myself, which is a virtual machine effectively. When we build a, go from physical to virtual, we're effectively building an entire single lane freeway for ourselves and no one else can share it unless we give them a username and password. But when we think about it as a multi-lane freeway, we can all get on the same freeway and just consume the bit we need as we need it for that little time that we're on that little gap. That's what microservices are about, just reaching out and consuming things as a service without worrying about the state of the environment they're in and what's behind them. And this changes a lot of the way that the applications that we're about to use behave and I've got an example to show you in a minute. So the difference is that in a virtual machine we effectively get all the same things in the stack that we would have in a physical machine, it's just that we can take a lot of very powerful hardware and slice and dice it like a wedding cake, but it behaves very, very similarly to what a physical machine is. In microservices we have the server platform and the host operating system, but all the common components like shared libraries and, and shared bits of code uh, sit underneath that and then effectively think of it like little zip files. You know, you take a folder and you zip all the files up and you email it to me and I expand it and there's all the bits and it's like that over here, it's like that there. So if I'm a developer and I build this container, if you like, and I publish it, when you want to use that service, you can essentially subscribe to the container, grab it, it'll instantiate instantly almost, consume it, and then when you're finished, it dies. So there's this great phrase that's used um, that I like, which is virtual machines like pets and containers like cattle. 
When we take physical machines and we go to virtual machines, we kind of love them and hug them and we, want, we don't want them to die. When we think about services and containers, we treat them like cattle. We raise cattle, we kill them, we eat them, we don't ever think twice about them, we very rarely even know they exist. We just buy them in little packages. So that's the best way to think about the difference between virtual machines and microservices. But they are coming um, and we need to really think about how they transform the way that IT is consumed. Because if you don't have the capacity to have cloud services to your end users, they'll go and buy it somewhere else. And if you don't have the capacity for software that's coming along today to consume things as a service, as a container, people will go and buy services from somewhere else, which means that all your big data centers and all your racks of infrastructure are of zero value to your end users because you can't actually deliver what their, server, their platforms need in the first place, which is why shadow IT became a thing, and CIOs are in catch-up mode with it. Um, so the true value of cloud... So when we think about cloud, we think about up here. And it's quite a good mental image because that's really where the true value is. When we think about the servers and routers, switches and so forth, most of the value, 99% of the value of cloud is above the hypervisor, which is why I, I highlight at the very front that I think hypervisors are not cloud. Um, in the early days of talking about cloud, we had this kind of model where we sort of had compute and storage. And we tried to glue bits together, but we really didn't get a lot further down the path than hypervisors were. Today, when we talk about what cloud is, it looks like this. This is an exact model that I talk about two to three times a day to medium to large organizations and government where we take all the legacy environment they've got currently and we try and bolt it in a seamless fashion to what cloud is. So desktop services, DevOps, uh, uh, the compute and storage, that's fine, but managed services like security, support, server and infrastructure operating systems, design and, and migration of, of things from one version to another, um, you know, direct connections, firewalls, VPNs, load balancing. These are things that we do every day in our legacy environments. So I take this model and I try to build a really seamless roadmap from one to the other so that it isn't this sticker shock and culture shock of going from one other. And this is what cloud looks like to most of the people I deal with every day. Um, it's no different to what they do in their normal data centers, but what's different is the way we actually build and instantiate and, and, and put those services in place. When we get to the point where we've had that conversation, we then look at a diagram like this. And what this is about is the bottom one is kind of our on-premise environment, everything we've got currently. And if we haven't got cloud infrastructure in place, uh, but we're thinking about a journey, we can still reach out and use cloud services elsewhere, but eventually we'll borg all our current environment into a cloud model. Um, but we don't have to build a cloud that has everything for everyone. So for example, it makes no sense for you to try and replicate Salesforce if people want to consume Salesforce. And in fact, it's probably the dumbest thing you do. Even running a CRM if most of your organization wants Salesforce is just dumb. So let's stop doing that. So the question to then take away from today is, what do I need to build today that's unique to my organization that should be behind my firewalls? Now, if you're really honest about that, it's actually nearly nothing. There's actually almost nothing unique about federal government or state government that has to be behind your files today. It may have been a view that was held a while ago, but that's not the case anymore. And so much so that a lot of those files are not yours. They're provided by third parties. So you took them out of your computer and put it in someone's data center, and then you outsourced it all. And now you're consuming it as a service through an outsourcing agreement. And very little of that stuff is really in your back office or in your data center or even the data center you've got. You outsource the building and the building and the maintenance, the building, the physical security of the building. So when you wind all that back and think, well, actually, I'm already kind of doing cloudy things. I've just not realized it. So when you think about that journey from on-premise to some other cloud, we already think about public clouds. Yeah, we've got Azure and Amazon. We've got Vault and, and so forth. Um, but there's a gap in between, and that gap in between is when we start to get to that community aspect. And the community aspect is, can you build something in your environment that's unique to you that others might want to consume, and are others building things that are unique to them that you might want to consume? So when I talked about the National Disability Insurance Agency before, I can't mention who's doing it, but they have an organization, the sister organization that runs their entire Siebel platform for them. So it makes no sense for NDIA to run Siebel because they've got an agency they're very friendly with that's got a nice one and is willing to multi-tenant. So they just consume it on a per seat basis. So if you move that up the stack and think, okay, I don't have to push out in the public cloud, but I can actually consume services from someone else in a cloudy fashion, it really changes the way we think about it. Now, it's really important we do that because you can't... It's, there's actually a famous uh, uh, American uh, comedian called Stephen Wright. He's got a very dry sense of humor. He talks like this, and it's this one line. He says, yeah, can't have everything. Where would you put it? Right? And that's kind of what we've been stuck with traditionally, where we build everything we think behind our firewall, and then we put it out into data centers, we outsourced it, and now we're trying to put stuff in cloud. So when we think about cloud, think about going and having a chat to some of your associated agencies, or even some of the agencies you may or may not have anything to do with, and learn about what they're doing, and see if you can collaborate and consume stuff elsewhere. Because most of the software that you're going to consume in the next three to five years assumes that you've already done that. 
So think about what that means, right? So a lot of people said, oh, we're never going to put stuff in the cloud. Office 365 came along. You have no choice. I, I checked in this morning to, in Sydney to get here, and they had XP. I said to the lady, oh, my God, I can't believe you're still running XP on the, on the swipe. She said, yeah, yeah. Um, biggest nightmare in the world, because Microsoft's not supporting it. Uh, and and, and you know, at some point, they'll change that. Um, that's kind of what a lot of I see around the place, and I, and I don't want to offend anyone, but a lot of what's happening in federal environments is we haven't moved forward because we got stuck somewhere and we haven't changed our thinking. This is Zoom data. This is an analytics platform. So when we all work in spreadsheets to play with cells and numbers and do diagrams and graphs, that's a dead concept now. So analytical tools now are coming along like this where we actually don't do the spreadsheeting. All the models, all the math, all the algorithms are there, and we just connect it to our data. This tool allows you to connect to every data source in your organization or external organizations or public data and data or public stuff like open corporates and do interesting things. So with this, I can look at things that are happening around your staff. I can look at your staff movements and look at weather and I can see what happened with your staff getting to and from work late and early and I can link it to weather and I can directly correlate that and I can plan for it. That's okay when I'm doing it on my laptop for a small data set, but what if I want to run that for the next three years and see what it looks like? I don't want to leave my laptop there and go and get coffee for eight weeks. I want to burst out in the cloud and I want to get 4,000 cores so I get it in an instant because it'll cost me 60 bucks and in 60 bucks I get three years of compute. Can your infrastructure do that today? Because if it can't, then none of your consumers or your users who want to get Zoom data or analytics tools are going to use your infrastructure. They're going to go shopping somewhere else. They're going to go and say, Vault, could we please have Zoom data in an ASD and IRAP certified cloud so we can push our data for analytics and, and, and big data compute? to a space where it's protected. Can't put it in a public cloud. And this is why it matters. Zoom data is a product that people want to consume today. It's a real thing. I use it every day myself. So your users are going to come asking for Microsoft Dynamics, which has this stuff built in, uh, uh, Zoom data, Alation, SciSense, all these brands that you'll come to see. They come cloud native. They assume you've got the ability to provide as a service stuff for Hadoop, Spark, and, and OpenStack type environments or open APIs. So even though these clouds around the world are Zoom data partners, none of them need apply for any of your users at the moment. Because when I run Zoom data and I push stuff into a public cloud or a hybrid cloud that isn't IREP certified or ASD certified, I can't use it. I can't move the data into there. It's a no-no. It's a fireable offense. So I couldn't use Zoom data in most of your environments at the moment um, if I wanted to push the stuff out into a, a non-local cloud. Because if you don't have a cloud that I can consume, I go listing elsewhere. So. Um, uh, the folk that uh, uh, can help you, <laughs> that I happen to be associated with, is Vault, and others will catch up with that. Um, but it's also important to think about what you're doing internally with that. But remember, you don't actually have to own the cloud. You could build a community cloud. You could bolt Vault to your network. You could bolt others to your network. You could use uh, partners in, in, who are in, in, in similar areas that have compute infrastructure. You might have one that's great for Hadoop and Spark, and someone else might have one that's great for some other services. So right now, if consumers in your organization go looking for these tools, they're going to replace spreadsheets that are going to give them real-time analytics. If you can't deliver that service, I can guarantee you they're going to go somewhere else. So let's figure out how we get you to that point. Let's figure out how we can provide cloud services to your organizations and how you can transform what you're doing currently to provide as a service and a container or as a, as a native API-based cloud service so you can do that because um, that's a freight train that's coming. When we saw the transformation of Office 365 and I kept saying to people, Microsoft's going to reinvent, they're going to become a cloud company. Everyone said, no, they're not, no, they're not. 365 came along. I've been saying for a long time that every application platform, Oracle, SAP, SAP just went all cloud, they've got all HANA. When you buy SAP now, you don't buy it on a CD and install it on your machines. They, they actually won't let you do that. When you buy open, uh, Oracle these days, the same thing. They, they will fight you tooth and nail from stopping you to put it. And if you want to buy it yourself, they'll sell it to you in an appliance. That's a big expensive rack with a red sticker on the side. Um, guess what? That's a cloud. It's OpenStack running Oracle and all the stuff you, have, you want to buy. In fact, they should put every piece of software they can wedge in there and you just turn it when you want. But that's a really bad way to consume cloud. Uh, because it's very expensive and you've got this dedicated piece of tin running one app stack. Um, so to wrap up, um, what I'd love us to start thinking about, and the thing that I set out to just one thing in your minds to take away from this, is that you've got private infrastructure. I'd like you to start thinking about what you're doing to turn that infrastructure into private clouds and the type of clouds you're building and why you're building those clouds. Do you need to be an expert hoster of SharePoint as a cloud service? I bet you don't. 
Now, there's friends elsewhere in government that have already done the homework to do that, that you can consume services for. And if you've got some concerns around security, I can guarantee they can fix that. Uh, but you might be building things that are unique to you. Uh, for example, you know, Department of Defense would be a perfect example of an authentication hosted platform because uh, they're pretty good at that sort of thing. Um, community clouds. Service providers like Vault Systems who have the ability to provide community clouds and protected cloud that don't have to sit in your data centers but aren't public, that are ARAP and ASD certified, you can use their infrastructure and consume it as a cloud service by just bolting it into what you've already got and burst into it. So when I build my models and things like uh, Zoom data and I play and, and, and I get a picture that I like, if I want to run that for a year or three years, where can I burst? Well, if I've bolted the likes of Vault systems to my network, I can natively burst into that because Zoom data natively talks to the APIs for network and storage and memory and compute and so forth and routing and switching and serving for OpenStack and it can build a, a little VPC in, in minutes and they can burst workloads into there in minutes and it can push the relevant metadata it needs to do analytics in minutes and you just pay for what you use and then burn it down at the end and it goes away. So this is the, the big shift that I want us to oh, sorry, the big shift I want us to take away from today is that we need to completely change the way we think about what cloud actually means to us, why we're building some of this infrastructure, why we aren't consuming it from someone that's already built it before. And if we can't put it in the public cloud today, who can provide it to us already? And let's get a conversation going around those. If you haven't had hands on OpenStack, build a lab. You saw before we had a little one uh, with half a dozen, well, it was about 13 machines because uh, we built a slightly larger one. But uh, I, I've gone to TAFE colleges and taken half a dozen PCs off eBay for less than $1,000. We built little OpenStack environments. The team at Vault will come along and help you build your own little space to play with. In fact, they'll give you a, pr a proof of concept VPC to play with. So get some hands on OpenStack. Uh, play with what microservices are about. Run some proof of concepts to, to understand and get a language and a vocab around this and see if you can get some behavioral and cultural shift in the organization about why, where you're going and how you're going and meet with some of the lines of business. So go and talk to your program directors, talk to your head of finance, talk to your head of HR and learn about the platforms and the tools you're going to consume soon because most of these platforms and tools are going to come cloud native and cloud ready and expect to burst. So I really love us to have a conversation after today about what that actually means and how you're going to get to that journey and build a roadmap and a timeline to get to that point so that you don't end up running into that brick wall that is coming at you like a freight train. Because there is nobody building software today in the planet, in the modern world, that isn't natively going to cloud, that isn't expecting to have microservices in place. Um, and if there is, they're going to be out of business very, very quickly. That's me. Any questions? Thank you. Um, so, uh, thanks very much for that presentation. My question is, what advice can you give the government uh, and the government representatives here in this room, uh, sort of pragmatic uh, advice around how they ask the questions and drive the change internally, so that some of these, so that so that having you know running applications on internal clouds and that sort of stuff. Uh, is feasible and I suppose the context for this is when you look at large procurements uh, in Australia for government systems and government solutions and government applications and government infrastructure, a lot of the decisions actually get made based on some of the compliance that's in that procurement document, not necessarily what the big functional <coughs> requirement that they need at the end is. I mean there's just some things that just simply won't fly, right? Because they just violate some compliance rule and things, uh, so the, the, the example you gave around, you know, which stuff needs to live inside and outside of our firewall, I agree with the things you're saying, but some of that would be contradicted by the way in which they decide where certain applications need to live and data sovereignty and this and other thing. So what, what advice can you give to the government on how to drive and facilitate the change that they need to do to be able to uh, apply these new, new tools? Great question. Thank you. Um, this is something I get asked at least a couple of times a day, so I'm really glad you asked me that. There's two pieces of this really, really briefly. Um, the first thing is that nobody knows everything about everything. So it's actually okay to ask questions of people outside your organization on what's happening. And that's why we have these days like this to share knowledge and, and, and insight. So one of the things I generally advise people to do is create a cloud panel, an advisory panel, made up of 50% of your own staff, 25% of peer agencies, and 25% of vendors, and meet once a month for a brown bag lunch. No sales, no pitching, and no rah-rah. And you just throw things on the table for this is what we're doing the next 3, 6, 12, 18 months as an organization. How can we be a little more 
uh, cloud ready, cloud savvy, whatever. That's one part of it. The second part is to actually have a hand on heart conversation with your own organization about why you've got those compliance and policy requirements in the first place. So something that I also do as part of my role with Vault Systems is to work with organizations to ask that very question of why did we set this compliance in the first place? Why is our hosting policy this in the first place? So the second part of that, once you get a group of people to get together and just have a conversation around this, like an advisory board, and definitely mix external and internal people, is do the rules that we live by today that we set one, two, three years ago actually make sense anymore? Now, there's a conversation around the world around things like electric cars. But six and seven years ago, electric cars were laughed on, and, and no one thought you could make a battery big enough to do that. Today, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about automobiles is not just electric cars, but autonomous vehicles. Completely changes the rules on everything, right? So now when we're talking in different forums around the world, it's this whole week around cognitive computing uh, in, in Las Vegas, we actually got on and off this little thing called an ollie and drove us around this 10-acre block of dirt for the, the, the um, Milano Bay uh, uh, Resort, a casino. And it was not until I was on the first, uh, sorry, the second ride, I realized there's no driver. Watson was driving the damn thing. <laughs> So this whole conversation of worrying about whether this stuff's coming, it's already happened. So that it's really important to sit down and have a conversation with all your organization from top down and bottom up and say, well, the compliance requirements we've got today, who set those? Because once upon a time, you had to go and get two ministerial signatures to go to the cloud. Now you need to get a couple of signatures to not go to the cloud, right? So it wasn't so long ago you were t told, don't go to the cloud, it's dangerous, we don't understand it. Now you've been told, go to the cloud. So you now have permission to have that conversation say, well, does the regulation that we thought governed us actually still apply? Do the rules and compliance that we're trying to live by still apply? It may well do, but pull it apart, unbundle it, and figure it out whether it does, and do that on a regular basis. The first thing to, to, to tackle with that is, have you got a cloud strategy. Now, it doesn't have to be this big, all-encompassing thing. It could just be five or six pages. It says, if we have this type of requirement, we'll consider these things. If we have this type of workload, it should go there. And review that on a quarterly basis, because uh, things are changing so quickly that something we wrote three years ago has absolutely no relevance generally today. You know, uh, firewall policies for, for checkpoint firewall one on a dedicated Solaris box on a 1AU Netra T1. These days, when you get a Meraki firewall, it doesn't even have a config. You plug it in a dial sign, you configure it in the cloud, and it pushes it down to there. They are so distantly apart that I couldn't even begin to describe them when we were in the, the, the previous one. Nowadays, firewalls don't get configured before you plug them in. You plug them in the dial home and you put the config in the cloud. So the policies and controls and governance around the security of those firewalls makes absolutely no sense today. So we had to run and catch up with that. And I promise you that applies for almost every part of your organization. If you sit down with the head of finance, the head of procurement, the head of cloud, and you actually have a, an honest, open conversation, all the things you're talking about will give you the chance to just think, you know what, I think we can do it better. You don't have to change it all in one go, just pick one thing. Could even be a proof of concept, just try it out. The beautiful thing of these days is that whether it's vault systems and free, free proof of concepts where they'll just host the whole thing with you, for you within reason, let you run it for nothing until you prove it works, because if you do, invariably you'll keep it there. Whether it's the shadow IT of someone getting a credit card and trying Salesforce, there's proven working models where the things you're talking about of reviewing your policies, reviewing your compliance, have been proven to be a misnomer. What we thought three years ago was, was the rule no longer applies. So it's about getting a little discussion group internally to talk regularly about the best ways to do things and then just review things on an ongoing basis to make sure that you really are playing by rules that are actually relevant. Otherwise, you're well behind the eight ball. Any other questions? Nope. Love to catch up over lunch. Um, we're doing a couple of podcasts on lunch, but otherwise, come and grab me, grab a coffee. Um, often people don't like asking questions because they're worried about who's going to see them ask and get the answer. Lots of organizations are asking the very same questions. Everyone's got the same challenge. So there is no bad question, there's no bad answer, there's no bad position. But there is a scenario if you don't get to the point we have in conversation about it, you're going to be in a bad place. Thanks for your time.